Hello and welcome to another episode of the ARC Service Park and uh, this evening we venture back across to Europe and to the UK to uh, catch up with uh, a co-driver that has a, a strong connection to us down here down under, uh, Seb Marshall, hello and welcome. Hi there, Adrian, how are you doing? You obviously were uh, an integral part of our very own Molly Taylor's career um, in 2011-2014 when she uh, took on the, the Junior Academy. Tell us, how did that partnership come about? Yes, it was quite an interesting one, actually. Um, at the start of 2011, um, I sort of split from the driver I was working with previously, um, which left me a little bit kind of uh, on the lookout for, for some, some more work. And I, I was actually just helping out the, the organisers of the, the WRC Academy in uh, the first round of the championship in Portugal. Um, and then sort of went to the second round in, in Sardinia, um, just helping out Phil Short, who's kind of a bit of a legend of the sport sport in terms of uh, coordination and team management so learning stuff from him and just being there and, and whilst I was in Sardinia um, Molly's mum Coral was over helping out spectating obviously supporting Molly and yeah we got we got chatting one day between the service breaks and she kind of was like ah okay you know would you be interested consider you know working with Molly and yeah about a week later I think uh, the deal was done so to speak so yeah it kind of came back in sort of quite unusual circumstances but um yeah obviously like I said it was a, a nice partnership you obviously went on to compete in a lot of uh, different cars and different championships with molly um across the time or predominantly in, in two-wheel drive cars i guess uh in 2013 we saw you come out here to australia uh, and compete in a round of the, uh, the australian rally championship at rally south australia as it was known at the time um for you who had obviously competed in the in the british championship uh, how different was was the australian rally championship in some ways, there were a lot of similarities in terms of, you know, the competition was was incredibly strong. Um, the, the sort of camaraderie and the, the welcome that I got was, was fantastic. Um, but I mean, the, the roads in SA were, were the, one of the real highlights, um, you know, particularly the, the Shire stages, the likes of you know, Tweeden and, and Goldfields, I think it is, were really, really fantastic experience, even even in a two-wheel drive car. I can only imagine what they'd be like to, to go back in an R5 or a WRC car or something. But yeah, it was... Um, it was the, my sort of first taste of Australian rallying before I, I came back to do the WRC rally. Um, but yeah, I have, I have really fond memories of that that week. Yeah, if memory serves me correctly, there was a few few uh, mechanical issues with the car, but um, you, you finished for a good result. And I think you were meant to come back later in the year uh, for the Rally Australia. That didn't happen then, but we, we did see you back in years to come and on a podium in 2018 with Hayden Patton. Yeah, I think statistically speaking, Rally Australia is my most successful WRC event. So it should be my favourite, really, shouldn't it? Uh, I've, I've, I've done it twice and been on the podium twice. So um, I, I quite liked the sort of end of term vibe as well that you got from it being the final round of the championship. It always meant it was really relaxed. And OK, in those years, the, the championship battle had been decided, at least the drivers, um, so it meant it was quite chilled out and the stages are, are mega and again the roads you know everyone raved about Nambucca before I went there and kind of when I got to experience it for the first time with Hayden um Hayden Padden it was yeah oh, I was mega really one of my again one of my one of my favorite events um just because such such a great atmosphere and good memories yeah, it certainly, it certainly was a, a great uh, event and obviously finished under, uh, I guess, unique circumstances last year. Um, if we can go back to Molly again, I guess we, I saw, uh, I was about a week ago uh, on her Instagram feed, there was um, a Q&A session and uh, it was mentioned that uh, one of the, the scariest moments that she had uh, in the rally car alluded to uh, that with yourself. Do you care to, to let us in on that one? <laughs> yeah, so it was in European Championship again in 2013. We were doing a rally in uh, in Croatia. Had to, it was a, a real tricky tarmac event, but it rained, so the, the whole start had been crazy, and we were actually in a, in a really strong position um, heading back to service uh, with one stage to go. And but we, I kind of felt, you know, when you, when you go through the refuel zones with these cars, and sometimes you get a bit of an overspill and it smells a bit strong, but I don't know, it smelled a bit different to me. And I was like, oh, something seems strange. Anyway, we go into this 30k stage, and about halfway through, maybe it was like, nah, this is this is really not smelling good. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, we we had a, f a small fuel leak, and um, throughout the stage, it was kind of yeah, just becoming a bit stronger and making things a little bit unusual. And yeah, it was kind of a, a strange experience that uh, yeah, got to the end of the stage and. Yeah, like, wow, you know, really caught, over, overcome a bit by the fumes. So, I mean, you were on hand, actually. That was because the rally you did with us in, in Europe. So you, you got to see it 
uh, see it as well. But um, yeah, certainly one of the most bizarre and, like Molly said, the scariest incidents we've had. Uh, you obviously finished off your stint with Molly and I guess was took another stepping stone in your career and you had a, at the same time, the last year of the your stint with Molly there, 2014, you, you partnered, had a new pairing up with uh, Kevin Abring um, in the European Championship with the Peugeot factory team. I guess for you, that was probably your first taste at, at, at a factory team. I guess much difference, uh, was there much difference between the European Championship and the WRC? I mean, the European Championship at that stage had almost kind of born out of the, the remnants of the the IRC, the Intercontinental Rally Challenge. They'd sort of melded together with the events and stuff. So there, there was still and still are some fantastic rallies there. Um, and the competition was still reasonably strong. Um, but it's fair to say you know, WRC is just on another level in terms of the, obviously the performance of the car is, is clear. They're the WRC cars, but but the, you know, the, the level of the driver's in ERC, you might have three or four consistently there and then a couple of local specialists in Freddie Loik's in Ypres, for example, or some of the Czech drivers on the, the Barham Rally. But yeah, WRC, you know you're turning up and there's going to be 10, 12, potentially 15 drivers who can all challenge for, for a win or the podium. So yeah, I mean, that was probably the, the biggest difference. Um, you mentioned it was my first time in a sort of factory environment. Um and actually, it was the first time in about five or six years of um, of working uh, or being in four wheel drive. Um, so that was kind of yeah, a, a bit of a back in at the deep end. First time with a big team, back in four wheel drive with a new driver. It's like I often said, I never did things by halves. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that was certainly proved proved that really. But no, it was it was a challenging year, mainly from mechanical um, reasons. But uh, yeah. On to certainly, like say, it was a big stepping stone. And I've seen some in car of, of you and Kevin in action, and Kevin seems to have for quite a unique um, pace note system. Can you talk us a bit through that? Um, yeah, unique is definitely the best way to describe it. Um, so essentially, it kind of looked a bit like an an, uh, the hands on an analog clock or watch. Um, so, like, he would have uh, a right 10 would be essentially where like one o'clock would be, uh, a 20 would be likes of uh, two o'clock and 30 three o'clock and then there were some numbers to fill in in between um so if it was slightly tighter slightly easier um and one of the key things that a lot of people picked up on was was he also used the french word uh, affront, um which was basically flat out um uh, he just preferred hearing that word obviously he was you know native dutch speaker so english was his second language even though he's completely fluent it's just one of these things that Affon was just a trigger for him and, and worked much more, uh, much more effectively. So essentially, he had a had he had a one to twenty system. Is is that correct? It actually went to sixty, but you never used every number. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it was essentially angle based, but, um, but yeah, with some some speed variants on top. So like I said, this Affon word, fast, very fast, slow. Um, I think it, it's like a lot of drivers. You discover that when you're starting out co-driving or, or driving and you're making your first pace notes, you often go for a very simple, you know, like typical one to 10 or one to six, but as it evolves and develops, a lot of drivers will add in things, how they can, you know, adjust the subtleties of it and think, Oh, well, it's the angle of a four, but I can actually take it slightly quicker and they'll add in a plus perhaps or, or a flat or yeah. Um, and Kevin's was just as similar to that. It's just, he started from a different base system, I guess. Yeah, I guess it is very. It's it's another language to to most people, I guess, that watch it from a raw. But that certainly was one that that caught my attention. Mm-hmm. I guess after Kevin, you you went on to I guess have another love affair with uh, Down Under uh, and partnering up with Hayden Padden, uh, which saw you step into the Hyundai uh, World Rally team and into a, a full blown World Rally car. I guess that must have for you almost been like a dream come true. Yeah, so obviously I'd, I've been aware of Hayden for for a long time and and been working with him for a couple of years um or alongside him i should say um when when kevin and i got a job as the sort of the test and development drivers at hyundai um so we were we were well involved with the team and i know i got a chance to do a couple of events in sort of the older car but um but yeah the, the the chance to work with hayden it was something that i'd almost thought a year or two before hmm, this guy's going places, you know, as he was getting his, his strong first podium in Sardinia and obviously winning in uh, in Argentina. Um, 
so yeah we we did a couple of tests together um just as i was filling in for for john often it works like that in teams you know if there's someone can't make it you'll get a super sub um and that was me um and yeah from there it was just uh, you know nice to get the, the opportunity to do a few more and then was asked by hayden you know would i be interested in, in co-driving so yeah at that point it was kind of unclear what what the following year was going to hold for me with with kevin so yeah naturally jumped to the opportunity and yeah i think it's the, those two years we had were okay we actually only completed part program um in due to me starting partway through 2017 and then Hyundai sort of rotation policy beginning in 2018. But, um, but yeah, I've got a lot of fond memories from that time. I guess you you were part of that Hyundai team where we saw the, the transition in World Rally Car and you obviously uh, you got to compete in, in both those cars. Uh, what was, this, this, I guess, the standout difference between the two cars? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I often got asked this because at the time I was involved quite heavily with Kevin in the development of the, the sort of the 2017 spec clearest way to describe it was you had the r5 cars and the sort of pre-2017 the, the the old spec let's call them world rally cars and the jump between them was quite big but manageable um and then the jump from the 16 to the 17 cars was almost the same again um, in terms of the speed and the potential of the car i think with all all these kind of top end rally cars the brakes are perhaps almost more impressive than the acceleration but the thing that you really noticed was just the with the addition of the center differential and even though i felt it less but it had a big effect the aerodynamics was that the corner speed was just or is just phenomenal you know the often as a co-driver you kind of work out your rhythm with the pace notes from yeah well i've got an 80 meter straight here so i can just take a bit of a pause or something but if you're going through a third or fourth gear corner beforehand well now in the new car, this this eighty meter straight doesn't exist. You've just got to keep going and going and going. And it certainly took a bit of bit of time to get your head around, um, you know, kind of working out, adapting your rhythm and and just the, the like I said, the potential of the car is just relentless. Um, I mean, it's it's when it's all working and hooked up, it's a phenomenal experience. It really is. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's an impressive bit of kit the the these engineers these years have uh, have come up with. <laughs> We step ahead to, to last year and you, you had a, a change of camp and came to drive. You partnered up with, with Chris Meek and went to the Toyota team who I guess was still, you know, still by normal means relatively new but have delivered a, you know, a fantastic package in the Toyota. Was there, what's the diff- what was, is there much difference between how Hyundai were doing things to how Toyota were approaching things? Um, perhaps not in the approach, at least in it from a, an obvious point in that sense. I mean, the, the car itself, the, the the engine of the the Toyota was was strong, um, but I think the because the, of the nature of the Yaris being quite a short, low to the ground, it felt more of a a racy car, um, and I think that that for me was most evident, particularly on on tarmac. Um, the first time I tested with Chris was on Monte Carlo dry tarmac, and it was just. Okay, it was a while since I'd been in the Hyundai on tar, but it blew me away, to be honest. I was like, wow. The, again, the potential of the car is, is so much more. And of course, it was it was designed and built in Finland. So on those roads, it was just otherworldly. Yeah, it kind of made, it made me realise, having been up against the Toyotas the previous couple of years, it's like, ah, well, it's no wonder you didn't stand a chance against these cars on those Finnish kind of roads. It was just something else. Um, and I think that came about, there's no, you know, obvious, you know, one point that's that's done differently. I think, like I said, it's just a, a philosophy of that car being perhaps slightly um, better inclined for those kind of circumstances and, and being developed on those roads. You know, you see that the Hyundai with its slightly higher ground clearance is much better on rough rallies like Turkey and Sardinia. And yeah, it, each car has its its subtle um, benefits, and but the Toyota was certainly all round a, a phenomenal package. We often hear, I guess, of you know teams or stories saying that, that the car is built around you know Terry Neville or or Oitanak or whoever it might be. I guess you were part of that development stage in, in Hyundai. Um, is that a fair assumption when we hear stories like that, or is it is it not so much the case? It's two parts, really. I mean, yes, there are there are certain things that can be influenced um, in the it's sort of the very 
initial concept and design of this. I remember Chris telling me about when he was involved with Citroen right at the start. You know, they before they even put the roll cage in, they got him in there and they worked out the seating position. So you know, he he was happy that, that was where they're going to bolt the the roll cage seat supports and this kind of thing. So that, in that case, it was very much designed physically around him. Um, but in terms of other elements, I think a lot of it can come from latter well, once you've got the base car produced is then inferring the development of certain things so whether that's um you know how the, the suspension dampers you can sort of go down certain paths with way that, ways that you're going to develop things some drivers are really sensitive to that um di- differential ramps and, and particularly with the center diff how that's controlled that again that can be very it can be fine tuned, but often teams like to kind of take it in a certain direction, and and that's sometimes more um, at ease for some drivers than it is for others. So yeah, I think th- there's there's an element of truth uh, to that kind of you know built around concept. But I think it's also just you mentioned there, like Neville, he's he's quite clearly the team leader at, um, or certainly before um, Oit Tanak arrived, he's the, he's the team leader at Hyundai, and there was a sense that everything was focused on him you know he uh, his sort of they, they supported everyone of course but there was a, that extra focus perhaps on on his car and and, and sort of uh, decisions that would be made post development testing and that kind of thing i guess it's it's all very good uh, a science behind it all and i guess from an outside looking in we, we sit in a service park and and or we watch it on all live out here in australia and we see uh see that the setups that those factory teams have and obviously hyundai had a pretty a pretty amazing setup was it as flat as it looked <laughs> it certainly is when I think when you see it for the first time, um, and and when you walk in, it is kind of like wow, you know, there's this car showrooms back home that are smaller than this, and would love to have this set on their uh, their forecourt. But yeah, I mean, um, I th- with, with with all the, all the teams, they've got these you know impressive hospitality structures and and service bays. I, to be honest, I mean, yes, they're they're they are very nice to to be in. Um, perhaps better are to ask the mechanics how how efficient they are. But, um, but yeah, I think whether it's indoors with Hyundai or or an outdoors setup like M Sport and Toyota and that kind of thing, yeah, they're still all very functional. And it's um, to be honest, most of the time when when we were back at service, I was just hiding around the back somewhere, just chilling out because you know the days are so intense and and so full on that it was just right. Well, I need to just sit down, take twenty minutes to have some lunch and or, or, or your evening meal, and yeah, the, the, almost the, the most boring, quiet room around the back could be where you'd find the drivers and co-drivers. But now we obviously haven't seen a, a lot of WRC uh, this year. Obviously, a lot of rallying in general. Um, unfortunately, it looked like you didn't have a seat this year. But are there any plans afoot? What is there anything you can let us in on on what what the future holds for Seb? Um, so it's all still a little bit uh, in flux at the moment, to be honest. Um, obviously, like I said, with the uh, with the the whole COVID nineteen pandemic, it's put a big uh, big breaks on on not just what's going on currently, but also planning for the future as well. I guess um, I was planning to be doing a few events with with Chris, um, not in WRC, but we'd we'd done an event in Belgium back in in January. Um, we were due to be going to New Zealand for Rally Fongare. Um So obviously that got wiped fairly, fairly swiftly. Um, but it, it's kind of, I, okay, I hope that in the future we might be able to return to do, uh, to, to do that event. Um, that's certainly one that's competing in New Zealand's on my bucket list, but, um, yeah, beyond that WRC wise or, uh, or anything else, it's still all a little bit, bit too early to be, uh, to be, have any firm plans in place. I guess from your point of view, there's obviously we've seen Citroen pull out means that there's a limited number of seats in those those top factory seats. Does that make your job even that little bit harder, uh, trying to find a, a seat at the top of the top of the ladder? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you can't escape the fact that there's now only you know realistically eight, nine potentially uh, you know frontline seats um, for, for drivers, and most of them are fairly fairly set with their um, with their co-drivers as well. Um, I think the year perhaps last year was probably the biggest co-driver shuffle we've had for quite a while with at least a lot of the the British speaking co-drivers moving around um, between the drivers. So yeah, I mean, it does make it harder. Um, But then it's just, you've got to look, look for opportunities where, where they might be, whether that's something in WRC2 or ERC or perhaps, you know, exploring something else. So yeah. um, The, the kind of the, the eyes and the ears are open and um, yeah, just keeping, uh, 
keeping tabs on what people are up to, what what, what people are planning, and uh, and seeing how it goes from there. And we saw you on the screens, I guess, doing a little bit of uh, work for the WRC promoter and uh, WRC All Live. Is that still still the plan for later in the year? I mean, it was something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, I was I was in Monte Carlo uh, just basically just to catch up with some some friends and colleagues and you know keep your face about. And they asked me there, well, could you just sit in on this stage to do some commentary? And I was like, sure. So um, yeah, enjoyed that. And then obviously went to Mexico to do a bit more of a, a, a sort of fuller job with them um commentating on the all live stuff and then also putting together a, a sort of big feature for the highlights program on sort of the art of pace notes as we called it um which yeah it was it was a really enjoyable experience and hopefully i was able to you know add a bit a bit of an extra dimension to their their coverage with you know, that sort of relevant current experience a bit of a, an insider insight so if i get the chance to do that again and i'm when i'm not co-driving then yeah that would be uh I'd be quite happy to, to help them out. Well, Seb, I, I certainly do hope that we get to see you in a co-driver's seat uh, again sometime soon. And uh, you never know, maybe you need to pick up the phone to Molly and see what she can scrounge together. But uh, until then, thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat with us tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at a rally sometime soon. Cool. Thanks very much.